Almighty and everlasting God, who's given to thy servants grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity, we beseech thee that thou wouldst keep us steadfast in this faith and evermore defend us from all adversities who livest and reignest one God world without end. We weren't quite aware earlier of the number of hymns uh, per season, but Advent has a number, of course, as you'd expect, but it seems like there's more on Christmas than on Advent. But anyways, we are now with working on the remains, not the cremains, but the the works of Archbishop Grendel, published by the Parker Society, thankfully, 1843. This was the Archbishop who was sequestered by Elizabeth for his failure to shut down the prophesyings, basically professional development seminars, functionally in the Senate or a regional area for mutual improvement of one another and occasional services for plague, injunctions and articles of inquiry for Project 1549. Uh, that's probably... They had one at Oxford, too, the day that eludes me. Letters to Archbishop Grindle, to John Fox, Bishop Ridley. Letters of, okay, to Bishop Ridley, this is before he's an Archbishop himself. Archdeacons, Suffragan Bishops, to William Cecil, a lot of those. Magistrates of Frankfurt, to Parker, to Dudley, to Zankius, Privy Council Officer, to Queen Elizabeth. Our documents relate to a sequestration to Whitgift, Hutton, London, and bishops. Miscellaneous pieces. Um, we'll see what that yields. Archbishop's last will and testament. An appendix, the Queen's letter to the bishop. Burgley's message to the archbishop. Speech to the archbishop. 485 pages. Observer of his life. While walking in the woods, an arrow lighted upon his breast and had not the book intercepted it, would probably have proved fatal. He was the intimate friend and companion of Edwin Sandys, who was a native of the same place and who afterwards succeeded him in the seas of London and York. At the usual age, he was sent to Magdalen College, Cambridge, Got to be born in 1519, so what we're going to say, 1534 ish? What's going on at Cambridge in 1534? A lot of Lutheranism is up in there at that point, okay? Once afterwards, he removed successfully to Christ's College in Pembroke Hall of this last name society, become fellow president and master. He seems to have taken the BA about 1558 before he came to be no, taken notice of. It. He made a figure in the university as one of the ripest wits and learnedest men in Cambridge, in proof of which we find him in June 1549, selected out of the whole university as one of the four disputants against the doctrine of transubstantiation at a public disputation held before King Edward's visitors in Cranmer would have been up to speed on what was going on at Cambridge with this gig. In the same year, he was appointed Lady Margaret's preacher, and also president or vice master of his college. In the following year, Margaret's and Queen Mary's reign. That's not the same Rogers. It is not improbable that Ridley besides knowing Grindle as a member of his college, also been impressed with a favorable opinion of his learning and abilities during the recent disputation at which he'd presided. The high estimation which the bishop held him is apparent in the following extract from a letter which he wrote to Sir John Cheek. Now the man Master Grindle, to whom I would give the prebend, 
that of Cantrell's or, uh, or Kentish Town doth move me much, for he is a man knoweth, known to be both of virtue, honesty, discretion, wisdom, and learning. <clears throat> Shortly after this, August 24, 1551, so he's using an English prayer book at this point. He was enter in St. Paul's, he dangles the prayer book. He's raised on the Sarah Missal now, Cambridge. While thus connected with Bishop Ridley, he was constantly employed in preaching throughout the diocese, a satisfactory evidence of the reputation which he was held when the choicest of men were selected for pulpits in order to impress the popular mind in favor of the Reformed religion. Now, often we kind of focus on Grindel and his relations with Queen Elizabeth as the Archbishop, and we, I, forget all the good work that preceded that. So he's in a place of favor in London with Ridley, and he'll come up against the Moran game and he'll get out of England. So he's a storied life, a rich life. In the same year, we find him engaged in two private conferences on the Eucharist controversy. The question on the other side, Fackham Young and Watson, I think Fackham Dean of Westminster Abbey. I, I, hold me to that. I'm just musing here. In December of this year, he was appointed chaplain to King Edward with a salary of 40 pounds. That's big money back then. And in July 1552, he obtained a prebend in Westminster. In the month of November, a project was under consideration for dividing the Diocese of Durham, then vacant by the deprivation of Bishop Tunstall. It seems that Grindel was nominated for one of these bishoprics. Newcastle upon Tyne, or Tin, I'm not sure how they say it over there, was to have been the newly erected sea. By the way, sitting out here in the boondocks of eastern North Carolina, you don't hear the English. You'll excuse me. Nine or ten. It's, you see it all the time. You know, as an American, you never hear it. So, candidate for a bishopric, a price center, press center at St. Paul's, favored by Bishop Latimer. King Edward dies July 6, 1553. And boy, within three, four months, the roundup is up in way. And by late 1553, early 1554, the patriots to reform theology are fleeing. And with him, the hopes of those who looked favorably upon the advancing work of reforming the Church of England. Foreseeing the storm which was gathering over the church, Grindel, in company with many others of great piety and learning, of whom several afterwards attained to places of eminence under Queen Elizabeth, took refuge on the continent. His first place to have ecclesiastical flares, and he applied himself diligently to learn the German language. You can imagine. He probably foresees nothing but doom and gloom, that he might be able to exercise his ministry in those parts. From Strasbourg, he occasionally visited other places and spent some time at Wasselheim, Spires, and Frankfurt. One of Grindel's chief employments during his exile was to collect, quote, the writings and stories of the learned and pied sufferers in England and to publish them, for which purpose he had a great correspondence here. Close quote. The results of his inquiries he communicated to John Fox incorporated them into his laborious work, the Acts and Monuments. How much Fox was indebted to Grindel will appear from the correspondence given in this volume, to which the reader The unhappy dissensions amongst the English exiles at Frankfurt in 1554, too well known to require explanation. Here, it is sufficient to observe that there were two parties 
one desirous of maintaining the exclusive use and public worship of King Edward's second book, the 1552 book. The other, other headed by Knox and Whittingham, did approximate the services to those then in use at Geneva. These dissensions and heart burnings were matters of deep, deep concern to the brethren at Strasbourg and elsewhere, who saw in them not only a scandal to the Reformed English Church, but elements of danger to the cause of Reformation in general. John Knox was being John Knox, a, a granite-headed moron at times. And we have to be blunt. Of course, he'd go up and take a granite head to Queen Mary of Scots. Bye-bye, John. Go to go about Knox. What was the matter with the 15 inch and hate and content, discontent? With the hope of allaying them, Grindel and Chambers were deputed to visit Frankfurt, carrying a letter signed by themselves and others, in which they pressed with much earnestness the dangers of the present controversy. The mediation does not seem to have been successful, but in the following year, another deputation, consisting of Grindel, Cox, Chambers, and some others, met with better success. Yeah, now that Knox has been booted. Upon the death of Queen Mary, November 17, 1558, those who fled at the commencement of her reign for the most part returned. Among the earliest, the Grindle, on the end of December, was on his way to aim or no settlement of the church. The work of reformation which had advanced under King Edward had been entirely defaced and obliterated by his successor. Grindle was a man of too much reputation to be left without employment in this important crisis. In order to its being submitted to Queen Elizabeth's first parliament, for this purpose, a committee of divines met at the house of Sir Thomas Smith in Cannon Row, Westminster, consisting of Cox, Sandys, Whitehead, Grindle, and Pilkington, who had all been exiles with Parker, May, Bell, and Sir T. Smith. Grindle was probably <coughs> selected for this, but also from the circumstance that he'd been a chaplain and intimate friend of Bishop Ridley, therefore well acquainted with the reasons and methods used under King Edward in the composing of common prayers wherein that bishop sermon at St. Paul's at the funeral solemnity of the Emperor Ferdinand. This is the only sermon more interesting as a specimen of style. In April 1570, Grindle was nominated to the Archbishopric of York, which had been vacant by the death of Archbishop Young since June 1568. His registration, is it, his register dates his translation from London on May the 1st and his installment by proxy on June 9th. He was confirmed at Canterbury on Monday after Trinity Sunday by Archbishop Parker and was succeeded in the Diocese of London by Edwin Sandys, his early friend and companion. The date of his new di diocese and province upon his arrival was far from encouraging. He found the greater part of the gentry in the north opposed to the Reformation and the common people sunk in ignorance and superstition. So great indeed was the contrast between this part of the country and the southern parts that the archbishop observed, <coughs> observed to Sir William Cecil, this seems to be, as it were, another church rather than a member of the rest. To remedy these evils, the Archbishop, with as little delay as possible, instituted a metropolitical, metropolitical visitation. Oh, that's going to go over well. <laughs> Beginning on the 15th of May, 1571, <clears throat> prorogued from time to time until October 10, 1572. The Articles of Inquiry, Inquisition, Inquiry and the 
in gym and will sufficiently explain the most obvious evils to which it's not so much against the efforts of innovators and discipline that he had now to contend as against the popular superstitions and popish practices which still had a hold upon the vulgar mind. But the prudent management of the archbishop, and especially by his diligence in providing men of piety and learning for ministry, he succeeded in greatly improving the condition of his province. By the care and diligence of the archbishop, observed Scrip, the number of papists daily diminished, especially in his diocese, who were a few years ago so many and prevalent in the northern parts. He showed his faithfulness in his inspection over the church by taking care he could that none but men of some well examined. But we'll have to end it here. Um, I remember really thinking about his work. I knew he had trouble up north. It makes sense. This all kind of hangs together. What is new there is that he was consecrated to York down in Canterbury. But Parker, that's a new, new bit there. Well, hit a Christmas hymn 91. It's a 17th century hymn. Break forth, O beauteous heavenly light, and usher the morning. O shepherd, greet that glorious sight. Our Lord, a crib adorn. This child, this little helpless boy shall be our confidence and joy, the power of Satan breaking, our peace eternal making. Let us pray. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor.